Right, senior reporter Aisha Ishmael live for us in Cape Town. Let's leave it there for now, but continue with that story. So civil society organizations are pleading with MPs to reject the electoral amendment bill in its current form. They argue the amendments uh, are not in line with just electoral practice and will not pass constitutional master. Now, political analyst Lukon Amguni is one of those who are raising concerns, and he joins me now uh, virtually for more. Lukon, I thank you very much for your time here on All Angles. Uh, firstly, isn't it also just problematic that uh, uh, you know the uh, minister um, went to the went with the minority with what the minority said in terms of this there was a majority uh, thinking around the task team well a, a good morning to you Masejo, and uh, please apologies for the background noise I'm at a conference but um, mm. it is problematic that the minister deprived Parliament of an opportunity uh, to evaluate both options that were placed before him but it's also problematic because he wasted money. I mean, if you go through a process and there is a majority view, it's actually more robust, it's more accountable, it's much fairer, it's much more inclusive than what he has gone with. It almost is tantamount to dereliction of duty. The minister is single-handedly marching us into an unconstitutional piece of legislation. And I think this point needs to be made to South Africans. There were two options, all that the minister could have done because the Constitutional Court mandated Parliament with mm. the amendment of the Electoral Act. He should have just taken the two options to Parliament and say, here are the two options, go have a conversation with society and then craft a legislation that is uh, you know, as wide ranging and as inclusive of the views of South Africans as possible. Mm. And just to get the viewer up to speed, Lukona, basically the minority view was saying that independent candidates uh, should be uh, basically, um, you know, competing with the uh, uh, political parties and not individuals and constituencies are also uh, being debated around that. But I think the other worry is, um, Lukona, the fact that it sort of disenfranchises the voter right, right? So it, it means that my vote, um, re does it really count if something like this is then uh, brought into the law? Well, your vote will count in percentage terms now. Let's be practical about the conversation. Mm. If you list independent candidates to contest with political parties, mm. what you do is that a person can only vote, can only make one choice on the ballot. Yeah. So if I decide to choose an independent candidate over a political party, I only have the ability to influence one seat in the legislature. Whereas a person who chooses a political party has an opportunity to influence more than one seat in the legislature. Now, this tempers with the demand for one person, one vote of mm. equal value. Those who vote for independent candidates, their votes will not be of equal value to those who vote for political parties. That's the first problem. However, if you need 50,000 seats to occupy, I mean, 50,000 votes to occupy a seat in the legislature, and as an independent candidate, you amass 100,000 votes. The other 50,000 votes are simply discarded. And because there's no way to then tabulate them into making sure that there's proportionality of the outcome, it gives favor to political parties to balloon uh, the number of seats that they could get, even beyond the amount of votes those parties might have accrued. Mm. And Lukona, obviously, even, um, you know, us as South Africans, we also uh, have the responsibility to uh, take part in these debates, etc. And of course, there was public participation that was expected around March. So uh, do you think that, uh, you know, the public, we didn't take that responsibility and take that right to be able to, p to participate in such debates? Or was this another, uh, you know, was this not properly communicated to the public and it didn't give us enough chance to actually debate it? Well, the public participation process, Maseko, was a shame. It was a shame on a number of fronts. One, the dates were communicated at short notice to the public. Mm -hmm. I attended a public participation meeting in Hamanskral here in Gauteng province. The venue that was communicated uh, was not the venue where the meeting eventually took place. So when you got to the venue, there was confusion. Then you had to drive to the next venue and try and find it. So the notice was short notice. Secondly, the public was not prepared for the debate. This is partly a very technical conversation yeah. about the type of electoral system, uh, the kinds of calculation uh, of seats equations that you uh, put in place 
and eventually how you make sure that you guarantee certain things such as fairness, proportionality, inclusivity, uh, ease of participation, and so on. So there was meant to also be an educative process rather than just a pure public consultation process. Lastly, what made a shame out of this is that political parties themselves began to bust some political parties, began to bust people into these meetings, give them a script in terms of you know what they need to read and therefore you had about 30 people reading the same script in a meeting now that does not improve the quality of the conversation it simply drowns one narrative into the conversation yet public participation in south africa is not designed as a quantum of you know how many people said one two three it's about the quality of the inputs and how the portfolio committees then evaluate that input and make sure that they crystallize the most constitutional outcome. In all the public participation processes where civil society was asked to make submissions, continuously made submissions, even in that short notice, and parliament has ignored the warnings that have been given to them that this bill will not pass constitutional master. And of course, we are running out of time because the IEC has said they need 18 months on any new system, and that 18 months ends in December. What this bill places in jeopardy isn't just the views of the portfolio committee, it's the 2024 elections themselves. Mm, and Lukona, this also brings, uh, you know, into the debate the bigger issue of accountability in our country, uh, because, you know, an individual um, uh, uh, candidate, we'd be able to actually go and make sure that he's he or she is taken to account. But with political parties and, um, you know, this new bill or the minority view that is going to be um, debated in Parliament, it would mean that, you know, while one person can be taken to account by the people who voted for them, the next person who belongs to a political party doesn't really answer to the electorate they answer to the party absolutely and that's part of the crux of the matter Masejo, because what we are trying to say is that the biggest outcome of the constitutional court to include independent candidates in national and provincial elections is that suddenly it will force political parties to open up those closed lists exactly to the point that you are saying in the local government elections, we know who we are voting for, even if they are from the DA, from Action SA, from the EFF, from the ANC. They filled an individual under a party banner, and that promotes accountability. That's why, even if ahead of a local government election, a what candidate is killed and they win the vote, the party is not at luxury to just simply fill that seat it does not belong to the party it belongs to an individual from a political party and that's what we are saying here one provinces cannot be constituencies they are too vast and they it, it would be unjust and unconstitutional and unfair on independent candidates and therefore we are saying let us design constituencies the electoral reform in daba of civil society organizations said let us have 300 constituencies in the country let us know who we are electing irrespective of them being independent or affiliated, and let us make sure that all those who are elected can be accountable to a constituency that knows who those people are. Mm. And Lukana, you know, this basically, if this, if Parliament passes this bill, I don't know, uh, but as a South African, what it would uh, probably communicate to us is that those that we've put on those seats at the end of the day are concerned more about their political parties than they are about our constitution. Uh, that's what it would communicate to me at least. I don't know if you uh, probably agree or you can explain um, if I'm wrong because then if they pass this bill it means that they themselves as political parties are not ready for independent candidates and they're not ready for the constitution to go ahead. Well of course Masejo, it also proves something that we did not elect the people who will be considering this bill. We elected political parties to choose who is going to be in the National Assembly. And this is precisely what we need to undo, because yeah. the individual members of parliament are more accountable to their political parties than they are to society. You can't even call somebody and say, 
you are my constituency representative because you probably don't know which Who member of parliament represents your constituency. Mm -hmm. They get given to you after the election. And this is what we are trying to do. We need to have a closer contact point with our public representatives. We need to make sure that they have a meaningful conversation with us as society and that they do not fear their party bosses more than they fear, uh, you know, uh, citizens. And people think this is a an attack on political parties. It's not an attack on political parties. It's mm. simply to say political parties must continue to exist, but they must exist in more transparent ways, in more grassroots oriented ways, and in more accountable ways to society. This, what we have today, is not it, and shows exactly the paralysis that has been caused by political parties to the viability of our national parliament. Mm. And just lastly, Lukana, um, we just received a message from my colleague, senior reporter Aisha Ishmael, who's also uh, been covering uh, this story. She says yesterday at the press conference, Mutualedi, and obviously she is paraphrasing him, uh, Mutualedi said it is nonsense that there was a minority and majority view. He says the panel he put together gave them two options to choose from and that they chose the option they thought was best for South Africa. But he also adds that uh, should the Constitutional Court find that they did not comply they will listen. What do you say to that? Well, unfortunately, Minister Mutualedi has been a bit deceptive, and I'm being very diplomatic uh, about this process. In fact, he has single-handedly uh, tainted the entire process, and he has to be taken to task. And I think when the time comes to take this process to court, he will be taken to task. The reality of it is that there were eight members of the Ministerial Advisory Committee. The one member did not proceed to share her view on the preferred system because she's a commissioner of the IEC. That left seven members of the Ministerial Advisory Committee. Four went with what we call the majority view, and three went with what we call the minority view. So the minister is misleading society because there was a majority view, there was a minority view. Just as, by, by the way, almost 20 years ago on the Fanzel Slabet report, there was a majority view, there was a minority view. And funny enough, one of the individuals who is again in the minority view this time around, advocate Panzit Lakula, was also against, mm. you know, substantive electoral reforms in the Fanzel Slabet report. She mm. has already been a crusader against meaningful uh, reforms, and I suppose she gets appointed at times uh, to make sure that she can frustrate the business of uh, <laughs> uh, uh, reforms. But Minister Mutualedi is misleading society. Mm. Lukona, thank you so much for speaking to us. I guess from now on, we should just do our part in educating the public and tell them exactly what their right is to be able to fight against this or tell, us, or tell government what they think. That was political analyst Lukona Mguni.